Tonight, getting out of Gaza. <laughs> Foreign nationals, including some Americans, are the first to get out of besieged Gaza as a deal is struck. The status of those who were able to flee and what's needed to get those who are still trapped back home. Plus, I think artists should be more afraid. What sweet music to some ears may become a nightmare for some of the planet's most popular artists. We'll show you how AI is changing the music business with one of the AI creators trying to revolutionize what we listen to. And... And I have now gotten to the point where I am willing to try whatever that is. Stardom and self-discovery, the Emmy award-winning star, the Fonz himself. Henry Winkler is here to discuss his secret to success. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more. Including the big day in court for Donald Trump Jr. as he testified in his own father's fraud case. Plus, the late news, the president and first lady will visit Lewiston, Maine, after a mass shooting rocked the state's second largest city. And he's been fighting to gain traction against Donald Trump for months. Could next week's GOP debate seal the deal? Tonight, we get to know the man behind the candidate in our latest edition of Who Is? with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. But we do begin tonight with the new and significant developments in the Israel-Hamas war. A select few civilians are being allowed to leave the war-torn territory. This comes as the UN Human Rights Office says Israel's airstrikes on a Gaza refugee camp could amount to war crimes. Today, 335 dual passport holders, including a handful of Americans, were allowed to pass through the Rafah border crossing into Egypt. This comes after the deal was hammered out late last night. Israel, Egypt, Hamas, the U.S., and Qatar were all part of the negotiations. Dual American citizens Ramona Okumura and Barbara Zind are in Egypt tonight. Some 400 Americans and 600 of their immediate family members are among those still waiting to leave Gaza. A fleet of ambulances were also allowed in to take dozens of critically injured Palestinians, many of them children, into Egypt for desperately needed medical care. Israel has confirmed a second airstrike on that refugee camp in northern Gaza, saying Hamas terrorists were killed, but more civilians are still among the dead. Our team is standing by with the ripple effect of this war now here in the U.S. But first, our chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, leads us off from Israel. Tonight, for the first time since the war began, hundreds of civilians were allowed to get out of Gaza into Egypt. Among them, at least five Americans. But the Biden administration are where hundreds more U.S. citizens are still stuck in Gaza. Working nonstop to get Americans out of Gaza as soon and as safely as possible. American doctors Ramona Okumara and Barbara Zind at the crossing, among those U.S. citizens able to get out today. Also at the border, some of the youngest and most vulnerable. They've waited for hours, some days, for this moment. Our team on the ground inside Gaza at that border as people desperately search for their names on an approved list, hoping today their nightmare ends. There were ambulances too, rescuing some of the wounded, so many of them children. And as the bombing and fighting continues, for the second day in a row, Israel confirming it struck the same refugee camp that was hit with such devastating effect Tuesday, claiming it was a Hamas stronghold. The Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, claiming more people were killed and others injured in the strike. Israeli forces pushing deeper into Gaza now, releasing video showing soldiers hunting for Hamas militants. The IDF saying its troops are now at the gates of Gaza City. Despite the advance, Hamas still able to launch attacks at Israel. Take off the sticks, take off the sticks. We saw it firsthand. And that's the sound of the Iron Dome system. You can just see the air defense system going into the air to try and intercept an incoming Hamas rocket in central Israel. And tonight, up to 400 Americans and their families still believe trapped in Gaza including Lena Paseso and her family. We've been following them for weeks, and we've now learned she's just received word from the State Department that she may finally be able to cross into Egypt tomorrow. Still exhausted from the horrors of the last three weeks. I just can't believe this. I just cannot believe how ugly this world is becoming. It's just horrible. Utter devastation. Ian Panel joins us once again from Tel Aviv. Ian, what are U.S. officials telling those 400 Americans still trying to get out? 
Yeah, Lindsay, we know that the State Department is now sending out emails to Americans like Lena, telling them that their names are expected to be on the list to be allowed to cross into Egypt in the coming days and to check each morning to see if their name is on it. Anxious hours ahead, of course, for them, but obviously for the vast majority of people in Gaza, their names are not going to appear on any list and they have no way to escape the war. And, of course, the more than 200 hostages held by Hamas, negotiations still underway to get them out, but for now, no sign of their release. Lindsay. Such trying times. Ian, our thanks to you. Joining us now to talk more about the opening of that border with Egypt is Steve Sosby, the president and co-founder of Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you're based in Ohio, but some of your staff in Gaza, they're close to or have crossed the border. Uh, where are they now, as far as you know, and, and what are they telling you that their journey has been like? Well, we had two volunteers who uh, physicians and medical volunteers who were in Gaza for the past three plus weeks. Um, they went there on humanitarian missions. One is a pediatrician who was seeing children who needed medical care and other types of support. And the other is a prosthetic and orthotic specialist who was fitting kids who are amputees with artificial limbs. And they were able to get out this morning unexpectedly. We got this news last night that they were able to cross this morning and are now currently on their way, exhausted, of course, um, to Cairo and uh, in need of a well-deserved rest. Um, um, their crossing took several hours, I mean, nearly 12 hours to get out. And uh, and it was a bit chaotic. Of course, there was a lot of people trying to get out, understandably, including injured people. And uh, we know that, um, you know, there were some injured people that got out through Egypt. And those are the volunteers who were able to get out. We have a staff of 40 on the ground in Gaza who work for us. They're social workers, field workers, accountants, procurement specialists. And we're just praying every day that there will be a ceasefire and that the violence will stop. What are you learning from your staff about those scenes at the crossing and, the, and, and what they're experiencing firsthand? Well, that it wasn't, I mean, it was chaotic and it wasn't very well organized. Understandably, again, this is not to complain, but you can imagine that when you have a situation where people are running out of food, running out of clean water, there's no electricity, there's no fuel, um, and that there's bombs going on all over the place and uh, there's no safe space, that people are becoming very nervous, anxious. They haven't slept in, in many, many weeks. For the most part, I think it was an orderly crossing, despite some of those situations, that, the situation and conditions that I mentioned. And, uh, you know, people behave themselves considering that it is kind of a desperate and chaotic situation in general, the entire uh, Gaza Strip. A UNICEF spokesperson has called it Gaza, uh, quote, a, a graveyard for thousands of children. Your organization specifically focuses on for Palestinian children. What are your immediate concerns for those who are still inside? Our immediate concerns is that children are being killed by the hundreds every single day. They're having their homes destroyed. They're being bombed. They're not able to find any refuge. The medical treatment is running out. Gasoline and fuel is running out. Uh, their pain medication is, is in short supply. Doctors can't use anesthesia anymore. Surgeries are being done in the hospital corridors, often without anesthesia. These poor children, kids that are you know innocent victims are being killed. Organizations like ours who are obligated to come in and provide medical care and humanitarian aid for these kids, first of all, can't get that aid to them because the borders are, for the most part, blocked. And secondly, we're going to be met with an overwhelming need that far exceeds whatever resources we have to provide these children the medical care and humanitarian aid that they need to live. Right now, aid organizations like yours are struggling just to provide the basic necessities for children and their families. But I am curious if anybody's thinking ahead about the potential long-term effects that this conflict could have on, on the children of Gaza. We have a mental health program, but it's 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 far short of what's going to be needed. Every single child, every single person in the Gaza Strip is being traumatized psychologically and physically, but tra psychologically traumatized, it's going to leave long-term scars in the mental health of these children and how they grow up with these deep scars of insecurity, of fear, of anxiety um, is something that uh, requires an intensive amount of effort to try to heal them, but it's going to be almost impossible if there's going to be a continuation of bombing and violence that is the root cause of this anxiety anxiety and this post-traumatic stress. Steve Sosby, we thank you so much for talking with us, president and co-founder of Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Really appreciate your time. Welcome. And here at home, a Cornell University student appeared in federal court over accusations he posted threatening statements online about Jewish students at school. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has those details. Tonight, authorities identifying the suspect allegedly behind those threats to kill Jewish students at Cornell University. And he's one of them, a student at Cornell. 21-year-old Patrick Dye, a junior engineering student, in federal court today, ordered to remain in custody. 
police raiding his parents' home overnight in Pittsburgh, New York, a suburb of Rochester. The FBI says Dye is responsible for creating a climate of fear on campus, making chilling statements online that Jewish people need to be eliminated from Cornell, saying that he was going to bring an assault rifle to campus and shoot up 104 West, a kosher dining hall. The Jewish student group at the university saying they're pained and saddened to learn such hate exists amongst our peers. The FBI helped, the university police helped, and uh, feel a little better now. Today, the attorney general noting the significant increase in threats targeting Jewish, Muslim, and Arab communities. As this arrest shows, we are focusing our efforts on confronting and disrupting illegal threats wherever they arise. Despite the arrest, Cornell plans to maintain stepped-up security on campus. But sadly, some of the students have decided it's simply safer to go home. Lindsay? Pierre, thank you. There is a push underway to push out one of their own. The House is currently voting on a Republican-led resolution to expel embattled Representative George Santos, who maintains his innocence after being indicted on a slew of federal charges. Joining us now for more on this is our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Rachel, uh, this effort to expel Santos was brought by Republicans from his own state, but mm -hmm. are there enough votes? And, and that is a notable point that you're making there because this was brought by not only from members of his own party but also from his own state that are calling Congressman George Santos who is facing 23 federal charges a stain on the institution. They say that he is unfit to serve. But this is also a very high bar here. You need two-thirds majority vote in order to expel a member of Congress which means that more than 50 Republicans would have to be on board for this push. It doesn't seem like that is likely at this point and this is also an extremely rare move there's only been five members of congress that have been expelled in the united states history three of those were before the civil war and the other two were convicted of, of charges lindsay so santos took to the floor to defend himself he's still clearly defiant I'm curious mm -hmm. what he had to say and if this fails could members try to force a vote again to expel him yeah santos insists that he will not resign he still is declaring his innocence take a listen I must warn my colleagues that voting for expulsion at this point would circumvent the judicial system's right to due process that I'm entitled to. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of Republicans that do believe that what he has done, what he has lied about, does not represent the Re Republican Party, do underscore that same point that he is making, that this would basically set a dangerous precedent. And they're also keeping in mind this very razor-thin majority that they do have right now. And if they were to expel Santos, that's one more vote that they would not have, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott for us reporting from inside the Capitol tonight. Thanks so much, Rachel. To New York now, where Donald Trump Jr. took the stand at former President Trump's civil fraud trial, prosecutors were pressing him about what he knew about the family business after his father became president. Our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, has that story. Tonight, the first of Donald Trump's children taking the stand as a witness in the civil fraud trial that could tear the family real estate business apart. I should have worn makeup. Donald Trump Jr. and his brother Eric took control of the Trump Organization when their father became president. Uh, these papers are just some of the many documents that I've signed, turning over complete and total control to my sons. But today in court, Trump Jr. described himself as just a real estate broker. And when asked if he was familiar with basic accounting practices or was a member of an accounting organization, he answered, sounds exciting, but no. Judge Arthur N. Gorin has already determined financial documents signed by Trump Jr. fraudulently inflated his father's net worth by as much as $2 billion. Today, Trump Jr. testified he wasn't really aware of what he was signing, saying, I leave it to my CPAs, echoing what he said in a sworn deposition. Whoever was bringing me a document, if it was more accounting, it was probably from accounting. If it was more legal, it would be from legal. And I'd, hey, like, are we okay signing this document? Do you believe it to be honest and accurate? And if they were okay with it, they'd have much more knowledge than I'd ever be able to amass. And so I would sign it. Today, Trump Jr. telling the judge, I have an obligation to trust those with expertise. He has argued he was not on top of the company's finances. I, I had no real involvement in the preparation of the statement about financial condition and don't really remember ever working on it with anyone. But New York Attorney General Letitia James says that's just not true, arguing Trump Jr. and Eric Trump were aware of and knowingly participated in a years-long scheme to fraudulently boost the business's bottom line to win better terms on insurance and bank loans. 
Aaron Katursky joins us now from the courthouse. Aaron, we know Don Jr. will be back on the stand tomorrow. What about Eric Trump and Ivanka? As soon as Don Jr. finishes his testimony, Lindsay, Eric Trump will take his brother's place on the witness stand. The judge has also ordered Ivanka Trump to testify here as well. She's appealing that order. She's no longer a defendant in the case. And their father, the former president, is attacking the judge on social media, saying, leave my children alone. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky for us. Our thanks to you, Aaron. Next tonight, to the millions of Americans under freeze alerts from Texas to New England, a sudden cold blast catching many by surprise. How long will it last? Our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano, checking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay, we had that bad wreck on I-90 today showing that this cold air blast is really much more serious than just an extra layer over Halloween. Now, lake effect snow is going to continue tonight across Lake Erie and Ontario, then pivot and diminish tomorrow. The cold air really settling in. Freeze warnings, as you mentioned, from Texas all the way up through Connecticut. That will kill the growing season, and it will force kids to bundle up with winter coats tomorrow morning, 20s and 30s across the board uh, for the eastern half of the country plus, but a nice rebound for the same area. Not so much Friday, but coming on Saturday, a lot of folks getting up and around a 70 degrees. Meanwhile, in the west, we're getting some rain, some heavy stuff coming into Portland and Seattle, the first of a couple atmospheric rivers, two to five inches of rainfall uh, tomorrow during the day tomorrow. Another batch coming in Friday and another one Sunday as well. Uh, they do need the rain, but it looks like uh, they're going to be maybe a little more active than they like here over the next few days. Lindsay? All right, Rob Forrest, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And a sad note tonight from the basketball world, legendary coach Bob Knight has died. The coach of Indiana University for decades to this day, he is the last men's Division I coach to complete a season undefeated. Knight retired with the most wins in men's Division I basketball history. It's a record that has since been topped. He won three national championships and coached Team USA to an Olympic gold in 1984. In a statement tonight, Bob Knight's family says he passed away at his home, surrounded by his family. Bob Knight was 83. Still much more to get to here on Prime. He might be cute, but please don't cuddle the Park Service's warning to fall foliage tourists. But next, would you be able to tell if the next hit song is generated by AI? How is quickly being used to mimic the voices of chart-topping artists and to create entire songs? You're using this thing to make money when you can actually just hire somebody for real and just put money behind somebody who has a real story, who has real talent. They're trying to make a quick buck while, while cutting this out of the processes. Whenever news breaks. The crushing families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the storm. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back, everyone. The future is already upon us. Artificial intelligence is becoming more prevalent in our everyday lives. Now it's making a bigger mark in music as technology is able to manipulate audio and mimic some of the most recognizable and famous voices in the industry. So what does that mean for the artist and for the fans? Our Phil Lipoff takes a closer look in tonight's Prime Focus. The lyrics of a breakup song. The voice, familiar. Listen closely. Tell me when it's over. Tell me when it's safe to wait. It sounds a lot like Adele. You took my heart and be in my heart when you up to wait. But it's not. It's an artificial intelligence generated sound alike. Uh, all right, here we go. I got the lyrics. You're actually listening to this man. The track begins as a 27-year-old New York music producer is singing in his studio. A few clicks later, he harnesses AI to mask his voice with the vocal profile of Adele to make a song that he wrote and produced sound like it's performed by Adele. I upload my vocals, my raw vocals, and I put them in, and then it, within minutes, it converts it into Adele, Adele singing it. It's wild, it's absolutely wild. You have everybody from Ariana Grande. To SpongeBob. To SpongeBob, you know. <laughs> Going by the name Six Foot Five, he's produced for queer artists like Alaska, Nikki Dahl, and The Rosé, creating this song to demonstrate how easy it is to replicate your favorite singers. If you type in Adele. The vocal profile of a musician is like an audio blueprint of their voice, created by people from across the globe uploading hundreds, sometimes thousands of samples by an artist like Adele. The more popular an artist, the more clips are often uploaded, and the more thorough a profile will be. AI takes them all and builds the profile, and they're posted on websites available for anyone to use. These profiles made without the artist's or the record label's knowledge. And they can transform this. Here's me. It took my heart and beat my heart when you looked away. Into this. It's exactly what you did. It's just her voice now. Mm -hmm. Tell me when it's over. Tell me when it's safe to wait. It's these rapid advancements in AI that amaze and it terrify him. and the music industry. How frightened should the music industry be as a whole in terms of the chaos mm -hmm. that AI could cause? I think artists should be more afraid um, because I could see the music industry, industry saying, you know, we, we don't really need you anymore. We have your vocal profile. There'll be thousands of people that will think, oh, it's a great Adele song. Are people gonna start saying, Let, let's make a new Michael Jackson record. Let's revive his voice. Right. I, uh, no. No. But it's already happening. This morning, the Beatles are back. Legendary artist Paul McCartney harnessed AI to finish a Beatles track. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI. When Paul McCartney announced they had used AI to take a John Lennon demo from the late 1970s and turn it into a Beatles song, people were just like, oh my God, they're cloning John Lennon with the world's ending. Over the summer, one record divided the internet. A song that used AI to sound like Drake and The Weeknd teaming up, but it's not them. It's a creation by an anonymous TikToker who goes by the name Ghostwriter. That made everybody freak out. That's a little alarming because parts of it sound ridiculous, parts of it sound pretty convincing. If it sounds like that at this early stage, what's next? Ghostwriter even submitted the song for Grammy consideration, which the Academy soundly rejected. The Recording Academy update their rules every year for the Grammy Awards. It said something to the effect of non-humans cannot be eligible for a Grammy Award or something like that. As new as this technology might feel, AI has been used in music for years to create beat patterns and streamline vocal finishing. I actually got a call from the poor Recording Academy rep at 4.30 in the morning, her time, saying like, yeah, we had to revise all that because they had to allow for the fact that like the way that it could be interpreted, it could say that, uh, that you can't use AI on a, on a song and have it considered.
The song was eventually taken down after Universal Music Group filed a copyright lawsuit. ABC News Live reached out to an online profile claiming to be Ghostwriter. They responded in part, AI is going to play a major role in the future of everything, and music is no exception. I want to do what I can to spark conversation and move the industry forward, so we are taking the necessary steps to be ready for it as it comes. Atlanta-based hip-hop duo Earth Gang admits technology is what helped them begin their career. Tell me, baby, if I die today, die today. Using a laptop to get their start much cheaper than paying for time in the studio. By the time we were in high school, all you needed was a friend with a laptop. That made everybody in the school at least try. They remember seeing AI being used to create music with the inception of virtual rapper FN Mecca. It's an AI artist, which was some computer-generated black kid who had this type of style and the swag of so many black kids. They're actually living right now in the music that they create. The digital avatar went viral on social media, claiming to use AI to generate songs, earning a record deal before public backlash forced the record label to pull the deal, apologizing to the black community for what they say was their insensitivity. You're using this thing to make money when you can actually just hire somebody for real and just put money behind somebody who has a real story, who has real talent. They're trying to make a quick but while, while cutting us out the processes. Earth Gang's new album, R.I.P. Human Art, is a satirical look at the role humans play in creativity. It is going to force a lot of people to actually be better and be different. You got a tambourine. Oh, yeah. You cannot have a tambourine. <laughs> Six Foot Five showed us how some AI profiles are better than others and how the technology works. This one is the one I used. But it's not perfect. AI kind of glitches, and it doesn't know what's going on at a certain point. He makes it sound easy, but it's important to point out he wrote and sang the song. I've come over in this time you let me. I knew that I wanted to put Adele's voice on it, so I had to do my own impression of how I think she would perform it. Do you feel like what you did for us is completely yours? Yes. You do? I do. Even with using Adele's profile? That was my own artistic choice, to use Adele's voice. I mean, why didn't I use Celine Dion's? And I still feel I bring like was yesterday. Artistic? Sure. But legal? That's up for debate. AI doesn't even necessarily hit on copyright law. I don't think they envision you know, artificial intelligence at the time that it was made. There's something called right of publicity, which allows people to protect and exploit their own name, image, likeness, right? So someone's voice. There are no federal right of publicity laws. They're governed state by state. Universal Music Group asked Congress to place new regulations on AI. The group also announced a partnership with some of its artists and YouTube in order to create a framework when it comes to AI, including a set of principles that allows creativity while protecting their interests. Hundreds thousand songs a day being uploaded. If you're a record label, you're like, okay, sure, maybe we can make our own AI tracks, but what about the thousands of artists that we sign on a day-to-day -day basis? We have to protect their interests. We made massive investments. Carl Folks, an entertainment lawyer, says some artists are adding clauses to their contracts when it comes to potentially using their voices for AI. On the other hand, Warner Music Group made history by signing a record deal with the first AI virtual pop star named Nunori. Streaming services out there, they're going to have to have a um, higher protocol and sort of maintaining what it, you know what it takes to upload a song. While the reaction so far has been somewhat split to these unauthorized releases and avatar-like creations, singer Grimes has said she will allow her voice to be mimicked by AI for a price. <laughs> creativity and that's the way she sees it she says if you want to make my voice a building block for your art go for it just pay me and how about the fans will they accept the generated use of their favorite artist's voice would they ever line up around a stadium for an ai artist like what we see with beyonce and taylor swift there could be virtual meet and greets you put the headset on right okay. and now you're meeting with your favorite artist yeah. in, in, in a virtual world Earth Gang says there is no stopping progress, and the key is to work with AI. The whole industry is going to spread out both directions. So understanding how, to, how much to use, when to pull back, what exactly are you going to focus on. And while Six Foot Five has no plans to ever release this song, perhaps AI could eventually be used as proof of concept to help sell a song to an artist like Adele.
Oftentimes, they don't have a lot of time, and better on you if you can present them with uh, a proof of concept saying, here is AI Adele, Adele, right. already singing on this song, see how good this would be. Well, six foot five song, The Cape, works as a convincing fake, he admits there is one big difference between a copy and the real deal. I get over perfect pretty quick. Yeah. I want to hear the human element in music, in art. So I'd be curious if Adele actually sang the song, what? Oh, she'd kill it. Right? That song, that song would be so good if you could give that to her. I know, I would, I, I would love to, and I would love to hear uh, what she would do and how her voice would sound on it. Um, because there are just some things that machines cannot do. I think we'd all prefer to hear from Adele. All right, thanks to Phil Lipoff for that. ABC News Live reached out to the big three music record labels as well as Apple Music, Spotify as well, for comment on how they plan to handle any AI-generated music that may end up on their platforms. None of them got back to us. We also reached out to Adele's team for comment and have not heard back. We still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. You may know him as the governor of Florida, but did you know what else Ron DeSantis thought he might be one day? The road not taken. So I wanted to do baseball. Now, I, you know, I was not, I was, I understood to be a major league player was tough, but I thought maybe on the front office side or business side, uh, and I kind of had that dream. We get to know who is the person behind the politician. But next, tis the season for holiday shopping, but will rising prices dampen the spirit? We look into it by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy's there was staying with her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. The greatest courage is to go about a day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Reporting from Buckingham Palace, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. It is November 1st. You know what that means. The holiday shopping season is already upon us. But rising inflation and interest rates have many shoppers rethinking their holiday budgets. We have a look at the reality of stuffing those stockings in 2023 by the numbers. 85% of Americans plan to purchase gifts for friends and loved ones this season. That's according to a survey conducted by NerdWallet and Harris Poll. On average, they plan to spend about $830 on gifts and groceries for festive meals, but that budget may not go as far as some hope. The price of groceries has increased more than 13.5% in the past year, and the cost of clothing, a popular gift item, is up more than 5%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's no surprise that 40% of holiday shops Shoppers say that they plan to buy fewer items. 21% say they'll be checking out cheaper brands. And 41% say that they'll be seeking out coupons and sales. For even more savings, 17% told a bank rate survey that they'll be making more DIY gifts. And 11% say they'll be giving used or secondhand gifts. 74% of this year's holiday shoppers plan to put gifts on a credit card. But for some, those 2022 bills are still coming. About half of Americans incurred credit card debt over the holidays last year, and more than 30% still have not been able to pay them off. Nevertheless, many of us will still be making a list, checking it twice. It seems even inflation cannot deflate the holiday spirit. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. My conversation with Henry Winkler, recounting his journey from happy days to an Emmy for Barry four decades later. He's telling his story as only the Fonz can. I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. I don't know, but I do know this. Oh, how wonderful it is just around the corner. And a major court verdict that has realtors nationwide reviewing their practices. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. Mrs. Kennedy's leg was stained with her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. The common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to a stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot. But Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline and Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The verdict that may change the way you buy a house. The baby bear shutting down one of the nation's top leaf peeping spots and remembering General Hospital's Tyler Christopher. Those stories and much more in tonight's rundown. A jury in Missouri awarded damages of $1.78 billion in a class action lawsuit against the National Association of Realtors and major brokerages, including Berkshire Owned Home Services of America and Keller Williams, after finding they conspired to pump up commission fees paid in home sales. NAR and the brokerages say they are going to appeal the verdict, but the decision could eventually lead to lower costs with sellers no longer required to pay a fee to a buyer's agent. Two other major Major real estate brokerages, Remax, and Anywhere settled before trial. Officials in northeastern Kentucky are responding to a deadly situation at a coal plant. A 10-story coal sorting structure collapsed, trapping two workers. One was rescued by emergency services, but later died from his injuries. Local authorities are using dogs, cameras, and listening devices in an attempt to find the second worker. Tyler Christopher, best known for his years playing Nicholas Cassidy on General Hospital, has died. Tyler passing away at the age of 50, reportedly from a cardiac event at his San Diego apartment. Tyler originated the role of Nicholas Cassidy in 1996, portraying him on screen for two decades and appearing in nearly 1,200 episodes. Tyler making his final appearance on General Hospital in 2016, and that same year winning the Daytime Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series, one of only three actors to do so on General Hospital. A section of a popular scenic highway is closed after visitors were spotted trying to feed and hold a baby bear. National Park officials for the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina say visitors trying to entice the bears with trash or food were creating a dangerous situation for themselves and the bear. They say fall is a crucial season for bears as they gather enough food to last them through their winter hibernation. The Blue Ridge Parkway is one of the most popular national parks in the country. The nation's infant mortality rate increased by 3% in 2022. CDC's report found significant increases among white and Native American infants, along with boys and with babies born at 37 weeks or earlier. Health officials don't know the cause, but two of the leading causes of infant death, maternal complications and bacterial meningitis, both saw increases. A Florida teenager got the best birthday gift, a family. Roman Balasetis was adopted just in time for his 18th birthday. Florida state law does not allow families to adopt children over the age of 18, and some end up homeless after aging out of the foster care system. Brad and Renee Balasetis have adopted 20 children over the years. Roman now joins their six other adopted children and two biological children as a member of the family. He just needed, he needed to know people believe in him. We are just one week away from the next Republican presidential debate and 10 weeks from the first in the nation Iowa caucus. Tonight, a new poll out of Iowa shows former President Trump with a commanding lead tied for second is a surging Nikki Haley and Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis, who has seen his support wane in recent weeks. We sat down with DeSantis to talk about all the hard-hitting issues just a few weeks ago, and you can watch that full interview on abcnews.com. But tonight, we wanted to get a sense of the person behind the politician. It's the latest in our 
our series, Who Is?, following in the footsteps of ABC News legends Peter Jennings and Charlie Gibson. Were you conscious as a child and as a young man that you came from a life of privilege? So did you think to yourself, Barack, what kind of hubris is this? Being president. <laughs> they said be a man. Yeah, they said be a man. They said we're not accepting girls. But you're a Mormon kid. No drinking, no smoking. Growing up as a child, what did you think you wanted to be? In a few words, who is Ron DeSantis? I'm a blue collar kid. Uh, I'm a veteran. Uh, I'm a husband and I'm a father. And uh, I'm somebody that um, has uh, always believed in America and has been able to benefit uh, from the opportunities this country has to offer. Ron and Karen still live in the same ranch that you grew up in. What was that childhood like? Well, I'll tell you, you know, my father's from Western Pennsylvania. His father was a steel worker in Aliquippa. My mom was from Youngstown, Ohio, which is a very blue collar, salt of the earth place in Northeast Ohio. So, so that was kind of me, um, more of a salt of the earth type of kid. Um, parents had very strong values. Um, they worked really hard uh, to be able to give me opportunities to play sports and do the things that, that I liked to do growing up. So you talked about sports. You were a, a baseball star from an early age, went to the 1991 Little League World Series. <laughs> went on to be a uh, captain of Yale's baseball team. What did you learn on that baseball diamond? It was perhaps a served as a life lesson for you? Well, the thing is, you could be, you know, the best hitter in the, in the world will still fail 65, 67% of the time, right? I mean, you know, it's just, it's a game that, that there is failure built into it, and you gotta learn to kind of bounce back from that, and, and that's something that I think baseball taught me. Not everything's gonna work out, uh, but you just gotta keep coming up. You're always gonna get another time at bat uh, to, to, to do better. How'd you meet your wife, Casey, and, and what made you decide she's the one? <laughs> so I was a lieutenant junior grade stationed in Naval Station, Mayport, Florida. She was a TV reporter, and um, we just happened to be at a, at a driving range uh, together. We were next to each other. There was a bucket of balls in between us that people had not used. She was like her back to me. She was kind of looking over her shoulder. I thought she was checking me out. <laughs> Truth is, she wasn't. We used the balls as a way to kind of have a conversation. And then I just asked her to go out after that, and we started dating. Uh, I then got mobilized to go to Iraq, but I told myself, once I get through this, I am going to pop the question to her. So when I got back, I popped the question. Uh, we got married, and the rest is history. You're a dad of three young kids. What kind of father is Ron DeSantis? Oh, man, I mean, it's probably the most uh, important thing I do in my life, and I think my, my wife feels the same way. Uh, so we have a six-year-old daughter, a five-year-old son, and a three-year-old daughter. So they're now all in school. We love our kids very much, and uh, we do spend time, though. If they're on the road with us, we're doing the homework with them. We're homeschooling when they miss a day of school. We do a lot of sports with them. They, they all like to swim. They all like t-ball and, and baseball. My son's a big football guy. So we like doing those activities. We try to spend as much time uh, together as a family as we can. And so that's why people have seen us on the bus together in Iowa, New Hampshire, these places. They're gonna continue to see that. Switching gears now. I just wanna do a little right lightning round with you that we've been doing with all the candidates. Okay. Biggest misconception about you. Well, I think it's um, kind of, you know, I, I came from humble roots. I think sometimes people say, oh, the guy got degrees from Yale and Harvard Law School. Like, I was not born there. Like, like I worked hard uh, and, and put myself in a position there, but I would not have been somebody that people would have thought would have gone through those circles. Fairest criticism of you? You know, people will say that, uh, you know, I take the position and I kind of stick with it. Um, I think most of the time, you know, that is the right thing to do. And I like to think that, I, that I'm open to new evidence, but I don't think you want to be wishy-washy. So if anything, I, I may overcorrect and just say I'm planting the flag. Um, and there we go. Biggest strength? That I'm strong, that people know that, that, that I will fight for you um, and that I'm willing to take the arrows. I'm willing to take the criticism uh, to do what's right. And if I tell you that I'm going to do something, you can take that to the bank. I'm going to do it. Biggest weakness? I think sometimes you gotta, you know, know how to apportion the time. I think I find myself just kind of going all out all the time. And, you know, sometimes you do need to take a step back from things. I remember first year's governor, nonstop legislative session, then the next legislative session, beginning of 2020. My wife and I actually had a vacation plan for the end of March of 2020. And guess what happens? COVID-19 happens. And so then we get in that and then something else happens. And so that's just kind of been the nature of it. The road not taken. 
So I wanted to do baseball. Fourth tonight for the Republicans, Ron DeSantis. As a swing and line drive, base hit to right field. Understood to be in the major league player was tough, but I thought maybe on the front office side or business side, uh, and I kind of had that dream, and then 9-11 pushed me to the military, and then that pushed me more in the direction of public service, but I was actually just with some of the 9-11 families, and it obviously had a tremendous effect on them because they lost loved ones. But, but my life changed as a result of that because of the choices I made. Had that not happened, I very well may have gone a different path. Our thanks to Governor DeSantis for the conversation. Actress Brooke Shields is talking about a recent health scare. She says that she suffered a grand mal seizure at a restaurant here in New York last month. She describes falling headfirst into a wall and foaming at the mouth. To her surprise, she woke up to find actor Bradley Cooper riding in the ambulance with her. Cooper rushed over after being told she had collapsed. His imprint on television is lasting. Henry Winkler's role as Fonzie on the sitcom Happy Days in the 1970s is legendary. After Fonzie came a few guest spots, a show that would earn Winkler his first Emmy, and a diagnosis that answered lifelong questions. It's a journey he details in his heartfelt memoir, Being Henry, the Fonz and Beyond. I had the chance to sit down with Winkler to find out what it really means to be Henry. What would you like to say to the people of the 21st century, huh? Because hey. hey. I'm the Fonz, huh? Hey. I never resented playing the Fonz. I would do it again just like that in a minute. What I had to learn was I'm now typecast. I thought I could beat that. You move to L.A. Within a few weeks, you land the role of Two. Fonz. Two, Two weeks. Two weeks. I was there the first week I got the Mary Tyler Moore show, which was, bless his soul, Matthew, but it was the friends of that time. Hi, Mia. Hi. Mary, this is Steve Waldman. Uh, Steve, this is Mary Richards. Hello. Come on. Hello. And the very next week, I auditioned for a brand new series. Sunday, Monday which I was stupid enough to think, you know, I was trained for the theater. I don't know if I want to do a series. Oh, it was below you, happy days. It was below me, <laughs> until it became above me. In his new book, Being Henry, The Fonz and Beyond, Henry Winkler takes us back to the beginning. From his iconic role in Happy Days. Everybody gets scared. If you're gonna survive in this world, you just can't show it all the time, that's all. Yeah, but you never get scared. I know, that's why I'm the fun. <laughs> to his role in Arrested Development, playing the worst lawyer in the world. Anywho, what are we doing here? What's the plan? The plan? You're our lawyer. It's a figure of speech. You're going to be fine. To like, his Emmy Award-winning character, Gene Cousinow, a peculiar acting coach in HBO's Barry. Here's my only direction. I want the cat out. 2018, after 43 years in the industry, you get that Emmy. Tell us about that moment and what it meant to you. If you listen carefully, you hear, this is Henry Winkler's 2000th <laughs> nomination, <laughs> his first win. <laughs> My tush actually left the chair. I run down that aisle, I am in heaven. I have 39 seconds to give that speech. I don't want to leave anybody out because when you say thank you, you do not get there by yourself. You get there with people blowing into your sail. And he credits his wife, Stacy, for helping him to get there. I know um, a fabulous redhead, yes, who, um, who is um, a revelation in my life. In his book, Stacy's reflections are paired with his story, detailing their beginning and where Winkler is now as a husband, father, and grandfather. He reveals his own struggles, including his fight with imposter syndrome, something he still grapples with today at 78 years old. You write about that you were still chasing the cool kids, never imagining I could be anything like cool myself. You know where that comes from? My self-image mm -hmm. was down around my ankles. You, you feel less than. So just because an artificial layer is put on you, which is fame, as long as it's sunny, you're having a great time. 
Winkler also reveals that at times he felt he had to work harder than others, hiding his challenges. It finally made sense when he was diagnosed with dyslexia at 31. How did you early on navigate with having a difficulty reading those scripts and you're on? I had to work harder than the average bear. Uh, sitting around the uh, any uh, project that I did, sitting around that first reading of the script with the entire cast, completely covered my shame with humor mm -hmm. because I stumbled. I just couldn't read. I reading to my children at night when they were babies. I would fall asleep before they did. My eyes got so tired and heavy, and the words were moving, and I just, my wife read them the book, I acted it out, that was my job. And you didn't get the diagnosis until you were 31, which yes. you talk about right. in the memoir. Was there a sense of relief? The first stage was anger. All that humiliation, all that punishment, all that expectation, was for nothing. Mm. My brain was wired differently. And the people who were yelling at me, who punished me, gave it to me, because it's hereditary. You talked about how your, your dad tricked your mom, 1939, yes. leaving Berlin, yes. coming to the United States. And, and you write about your relatives who were left behind, who you never saw again. Right. You write, I mourned that I never had relatives. My only relatives were faux members of the German refugee community in New York. Why was it important for you to tell your own story, but, but theirs as well? Because they are part of my story. I am their experience. Anything else that you still have not done that you really want to do? I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. I don't know. But I do know this, what I have learned, what I have tried to pass on in being Henry is, oh, how wonderful it is just around the corner. And I have now gotten to the point where I am willing to try whatever that is. What a fun conversation with him. You can find Being Henry the Fonz and Beyond anywhere books are sold. Finally tonight, one week after 18 people were killed in a mass shooting, Lewiston High School is back on the football field. The Blue Devils are taking on their rivals from Edward Little High School in the so-called Battle of the Bridge. A moment of silence was held for victims during the game. Beforehand, some celebrities came together to cheer on both teams, including Will Farrell and former Patriots player Rob Gunkowski. Everyone's going to be watching. Everyone's going to be talking about it. So let's bring it on. Let's bring it on like it's Donkey Kong. We all know you guys are rivals, and it's going to be a huge game. And I just want to say you guys are amazing, sticking together to stay strong through these tough times. Hope to see some Grant Spike videos. Play ball. Let's go. President Biden and the First Lady will visit Lewiston on Friday. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, freeze warnings from Texas to New Jersey and the coldest weather is still yet to come. We have the forecast. And Pakistan begins rounding up undocumented foreigners for deportation, many who've lived there for decades. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. 
three. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us afternoons for everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. Mrs. Kennedy's dress was stained her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the foreign nationals, among them some Americans, getting out of besieged Gaza as a deal is struck the status of those who were able to flee and what's needed to get those still trapped back home. Plus, the House voted has decided George Santos's fate in Congress, and we introduce you to the 14-year-old who just may have discovered a new treatment for cancer. But we do begin tonight with those new and significant developments in the Israel-Hamas war. A select few civilians are being allowed to leave the war-torn territory. This comes as the UN Human Rights Office says Israel's airstrikes on a Gaza refugee camp could amount to war crimes. Today, 335 dual passport holders, including a handful of Americans, were allowed to pass through the Rafah border crossing into Egypt. This comes after the deal was hammered out late last night. Israel, Egypt, Hamas, the U.S., and Qatar were all part of the negotiations. Dual American citizens Ramona Okumura and Barbara Designed are in Egypt tonight. Some 400 Americans and 600 of their immediate family members are among those still waiting to leave Gaza. A fleet of ambulances were also allowed in to take dozens of critically injured Palestinians, many of them children, into Egypt for desperately needed medical care. Our chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, leads us off from Israel. <laughs> Tonight, for the first time since the war began, hundreds of civilians were allowed to get out of Gaza into Egypt. Among them, at least five Americans. But the Biden administration are where hundreds more U.S. citizens are still stuck in Gaza. Working nonstop to get Americans out of Gaza as soon and as safely as possible. American doctors Ramona Okumara and Barbara Zind at the crossing, among those U.S. citizens able to get out today. Also at the border, some of the youngest and most vulnerable. They've waited for hours, some days, for this moment. Our team on the ground inside Gaza at that border as people desperately search for their names on an approved list, hoping today their nightmare ends. There were ambulances too, rescuing some of the wounded, so many of them children. And as the bombing and fighting continues, for the second day in a row, Israel confirming it struck the same refugee camp that was hit with such devastating effect Tuesday, claiming it was a Hamas stronghold. The Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, claiming more people were killed and others injured in the strike. 
Israeli forces pushing deeper into Gaza now, releasing video showing soldiers hunting for Hamas militants. The IDF saying its troops are now at the gates of Gaza City. Despite the advance, Hamas still able to launch attacks at Israel. Take off the sticks, take off the sticks. We saw it firsthand. sound of the Iron Dome system, you can just see the air defence system going into the air to try and intercept an incoming Hamas rocket in central Israel. And tonight, up to 400 Americans and their families still believe trapped in Gaza, including Lena Paseso and her family. We've been following them for weeks, and we've now learned she's just received word from the State Department that she may finally be able to cross into Egypt tomorrow. Still exhausted from the horrors of the last three weeks. I just can't believe this. I just cannot believe how ugly this world is becoming. It's just horrible. Utter devastation. Our thanks to Ian for that. A Cornell University student has been charged with making anti-Semitic threats to the school's Jewish students. Patrick Dye, a junior at Cornell, was charged by the Justice Department with making explicit threats against Jewish people, allegedly including threats of rape and murder. Dye threatened to bring an assault rifle to campus and shoot Jews. The charge filed against Dye carries a maximum of five years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. The push to expel New York Congressman George Santos has failed. Santos has maintained his innocence after being indicted on a slew of federal charges. And joining us now for more on this is our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Hey, Rachel, this was a resolution Santos' own party brought forth, and it failed. Just explain to us what happened. Congressman George Santos will live to see another day here on Capitol Hill. He has survived this push to expel him from Congress. And this was really a party line vote for the most part. Republicans and a handful of Democrats throwing him this political lifeline here, even as he faces 23 federal charges accused of lying about every single aspect of his life. Right before that vote, Santos took to the floor in an attempt to defend himself. Take a listen to what he said. I must warn my colleagues that voting for expulsion at this point would circumvent the judicial system's right to due process that I'm entitled to. And that point was underscored by many Republicans who uh, voted against this measure tonight, saying that this should play out in the courts first, and then the House should move to consider this, arguing that it sets a dangerous precedent, noting that only five members of Congress have been expelled in U.S. history, three of them before the Civil War, and the other two were convicted of charges, Lindsay. So it failed today, but could we see this come up again? we could definitely see it come up again. And I asked that question to some of the Republicans that actually brought this to the floor today, and they did not rule that out at all. We know that in addition to the federal investigation that is ongoing, there's also an ethics investigation unfolding here on Capitol Hill. They released an update saying that they would have more information to share in just a matter of weeks, so those New York Republicans could try to force this vote once again, Lindsay. Rachel Scott from the Capitol for us. Thanks so much, Thank Rachel. To New York now, where Donald Trump Jr. took the stand at former President Trump's civil fraud trial. Prosecutors were pressing him about what he knew about the family business after his father became president. Our senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has more. Tonight, the first of Donald Trump's children taking the stand as a witness in the civil fraud trial that could tear the family real estate business apart. I should have worn makeup. Donald Trump Jr. and his brother Eric took control of the Trump organization when their father became president. So these papers are just some of the many documents that I've signed, turning over complete and total control to my sons. But today in court, Trump Jr. described himself as just a real estate broker. And when asked if he was familiar with basic accounting practices or was a member of an accounting organization, he answered, sounds exciting, but no. Judge Arthur N. Gorin has already determined financial documents signed by Trump Jr. fraudulently inflated his father's net worth by as much as $2 billion. Today, Trump Jr. testified he wasn't really aware of what he was signing, saying, I leave it to my CPAs, echoing what he said in a sworn deposition. Whoever was bringing me a document, if it was more accounting, it was probably from accounting. If it was more legal, it would be from legal. And I'd, hey, like, are we okay signing this document? Do you believe it to be honest and accurate? And if they were okay with it, they'd have much more knowledge than I'd ever be able to amass. And so I would sign it. Today, Trump Jr. telling the judge, I have an obligation to trust those with expertise. He has argued he was not on top of the company's finances. 
you know, I, I had no real involvement in the preparation of the statement about financial condition and don't really remember ever working on it with anyone. But New York Attorney General Letitia James says that's just not true, arguing Trump Jr. and Eric Trump were aware of and knowingly participated in a years-long scheme to fraudulently boost the business's bottom line to win better terms on insurance and bank loans. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. The average American holds almost $8,000 in credit card debt, and thankfully for millions out there, that debt will not get more expensive to hold on to after the Federal Reserve left interest rates unchanged today. The announcement from the Fed came after a two-day policy meeting, and while they ruled out an interest rate hike, they left the door open for a December increase. All told, the Fed has raised rates 11 times in the last year and a half, raising them to their highest levels in more than two decades. Next tonight, to the commercial pilot who allegedly threatened his co-pilot with a gun while on board a Delta flight. He no longer works for the company, but we're learning more about what happened in the incident last year, which is just now becoming public. Gio Benitez has that story. Tonight, a Delta pilot is facing criminal charges after allegedly pulling a gun on the captain in the cockpit. A grand jury in Utah indicting First Officer Jonathan Dunn for assaulting and intimidating a crew member back in August 2022. It happened after a disagreement over whether to divert the flight for a passenger's medical emergency. Dunn, allegedly with gun in hand, is accused of telling his co-pilot, the captain, that he would be shot multiple times if the captain diverted the flight. The Department of Transportation's Office of Inspector General says Dunn was authorized to carry a gun in the cockpit through the TSA's federal flight deck officer program that was put in place after 9-11. It's part of a layered program that TSA has in place to protect the traveling public. It comes just days after off-duty Alaska Airlines pilot Joseph David Emerson pleaded not guilty to 83 counts of attempted murder for allegedly trying to crash a passenger jet. That pilot telling police he was having a nervous breakdown after consuming psychedelic mushrooms. Gio Benitez joins us now. Gio, what a scary situation. What else can you tell us? Well, Lindsay, Delta says that Jonathan Dunn is no longer working for the airline. And if convicted, he faces up to 20 years in prison. And again, I just want to mention that program about allowing guns in the cockpit. What was important about that is that it was added as, an, as another layer of security. And so that's why that was so important. And so here you're looking at this and a lot of people in the industry are saying, well, that is not what it was intended to be to threaten someone else in the cockpit. Lindsay? Not what it was intended for at all. All right, Gio Benitez for us. Thanks so much, Gio. An update now to an exclusive interview we brought you a few weeks ago on the death of a retired police officer. Newly released body camera video shows the moments after his wife and daughter arrived at the scene. He was killed in a deadly hit and run in Las Vegas, and two teens are charged in the crime. Arcana Whitworth spoke to the family about their loss and the criminal investigation. She has the latest details on these new developments. Tonight, new body camera video showing the moments the family of a retired police chief rushed to the scene of a hit and run that left him dead and two teens now charged in his murder. I have to leave everything the way it is. 64-year-old Andy Propes was riding his bike in Las Vegas on August 14th when police say Jesus Celaya, driving a stolen car with the mere keys inside, intentionally struck the cyclist, then fled. Okay, the victim's mangled bike in the street. If you believe it's probably going to go fatal, we're going to shut this whole place down. Both teens later arrested. The suspected driver heard talking to police in body camera video. I'll be on like 30 days. Prosecutors say one of them even recorded this video of that fatal hit and run. It's hard to grieve when you have anger. The retired police chief's family telling me they're devastated. I'll never get to have my dad there, have that, you know, daddy-daughter dance, have him give me away or anything like that, and that hurts. Such a senseless loss. Kena Whitworth joins us now. Kena, what else do we know about the suspects in this case? Right, Lindsay, so they will be tried here as adults. They are facing murder charges, among other charges, and what authorities say really was a string of crimes that morning. Now, these suspects have pleaded not guilty, but, Lindsay, authorities told me that they are looking into their past because they said when they watched that video that it was clear to them this wasn't the first time that they had done something like that. And also, Lindsay, we did reach out to the attorneys. One of them did get back to us and expressed one and only concern here that his client gets a fair trial. Lindsay. Kena Whitworth for us. Thanks so much, Kena.
Fire and smoke from a major fire outside of Los Angeles is threatening 2,000 homes and structures. The fire is exploding inside due, in size due to the Santa Ana winds. 4,000 residents have been ordered to evacuate. Tonight, the race to save so many homes. ABC's Faith Abube reports from Los Angeles. Tonight, from the air and on the ground, more than a thousand firefighters racing to contain a wildfire in Southern California. It is totally blowing. The wind is blowing horrendously. The Highland Fire breaking out Monday afternoon east of Los Angeles in Riverside County, doubling in size to nearly 2,500 acres, fueled by strong Santa Ana winds, threatening more than 2,000 homes and structures. Several have already burned. The inferno putting about 4,000 residents under an evacuation order. For some, there was little time to escape. It turned from not too dangerous to out of there in about 30 minutes. Hundreds of families have already abandoned their homes. Crews using chainsaws, not only battling the fire, but also the steep and rugged terrain, rushing livestock and horses to safer grounds. And Lindsay, at least one firefighter was injured while battling this wildfire. Right now, no word on what sparked it. Lindsay. Faith, thank you. Next tonight, to the millions of Americans under freeze alerts from Texas to New England, the sudden cold blast catching many by surprise. How long will it last? Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano checking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay, we had that bad wreck on I-90 today showing that this cold air blast is really much more serious than just an extra layer over Halloween. Now, lake effect snow is going to continue tonight across Lake Erie and Ontario, then pivot and diminish tomorrow. And the cold air really settling in. Freeze warnings, as you mentioned, from Texas all the way up through Connecticut. That will kill the growing season, and it will force kids to bundle up with winter coats tomorrow morning, 20s and 30s across the board uh, for the eastern half of the country plus. But a nice rebound for the same area. Not so much Friday, but coming on Saturday, a lot of folks get up and around a 70 degrees. Meanwhile, in the west, we're getting some rain, some heavy stuff coming into Portland and Seattle, the first of a couple atmospheric rivers, two to five inches of rainfall uh, tomorrow during the day tomorrow. Another batch coming in Friday and another one Sunday as well. Uh, they do need the rain, but it looks like uh, they're going to be maybe a little more active than they like here over the next few days. Lindsay? All right, Rob, for us, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, meet the 14-year-old who may have just discovered a new treatment for cancer. But next, the rescue operation to save a cat abandoned outside Russia's Kremlin. Families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Matt Gutman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking several headlines around the world. Pakistani authorities started rounding up undocumented foreigners ahead of a midnight deadline for them to leave or face expulsion. Officials said more than 140,000 people had already voluntarily left after days in which trucks piled with belongings and crammed with people made their way out. Afghans have made up the bulk of those who left after what for some has been decades of living in Pakistan. Bushfires blazed across northern New South Wales in Australia. This is the country continues to battle blazes in Queensland that have killed at least two people and destroyed dozens of homes. Residents there were even ordered to evacuate their homes as bushfires burned out of control. Emergency services and police broke into a car near Moscow's Kremlin after reports of a cat being locked inside. Local news outlets reported the cat spent several days in the car without food or water. The cat was dehydrated and hungry, but otherwise in good shape. An officer working for Moscow's prosecutor's office was reported to have temporarily, temporarily adopted the cat while it recuperates. For years, our next guest has written about everything from the Black Lives Matter movement and gender equality to Nicki Minaj's discography and the Fast and Furious franchise, all while strongly expressing her opinions. Roxane Gay is a best-selling author and a contributing writer for The New York Times. She's also the author of the new book, Opinions, a decade of arguments, criticism, and minding other people's business. Roxane joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's just take it actually back to the beginning when you said, you know what, I have an opinion and doggone it, I want people to hear it. Yes, definitely. You know, the first, I've always, I think, been opinionated, but I don't know that I've expressed those opinions. But many years ago, I read a story in the New York Times about a young girl who was gang raped in Cleveland, Texas. Oh. And the reportage was about how the town was struggling. And I thought, that's interesting because really I would think that the child at the heart of all of this is suffering. And so I wrote an essay called The Careless Language of Sexual Violence. And for whatever reason, that essay hit a nerve. And from then on, I started writing my opinions into the world. You write often about race relations. Mm -hmm. In particular, you write, to be black in America is to exist with the presumption of guilt, burdened by an implacable demand to prove our innocence. Explain what you mean by mm -hmm. that, and what do you hope that people take away, ultimately, from, from the book and the opinions that you share in it? Yes, when I was writing that piece, I was thinking about the ways in which black people are often considered guilty until proven innocent, and what kind of burden it is to live in a world where you are presumed guilty for existing. And that leads to things like police brutality and extrajudicial murder and it is unfair, the world is unfair, of course, but it feels like this is a level of unfair that no one should have to tolerate. You have your own master class, and in it, you encourage writers not to shy away from expressing themselves. And, and specifically, you say, um, you don't need to be brave when you're writing. You need to acknowledge that you're terrified and do it anyway. Why is that so important? It's incredibly important because a lot of times I think people wait until they have just enough courage for that perfect moment. And that perfect moment is never ever gonna come. And for most of us, that moment where we are completely unafraid is never gonna come. And so you have to develop a tolerance for discomfort and a tolerance for being afraid, but finding a way to do something anyway. And that's how I'm able to put any of my work into the world is, of course, I'm terrified by what people might say, the level of pushback, the level of trolling on the Internet. But I do it anyway because that's what I love to do as a writer. I love to write. And inevitably, at some point in your career as a writer, you hope that someone will read your work. And when they read, you can't control that response. Hate doesn't hide. That's what you called one of your opinions that you wrote back in 2017 on Charlottesville. Mm. And, and I am curious, of course, we're talking about the white supremacist rally in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, curious your thoughts on, on the recent rise in, in hate crimes with regard to all races, religions. Yes. Whenever something happens in the public sphere that would provide people cover for being openly racist, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, people will take that opportunity because they know it's wrong and they want some kind of public sanction in order to be able to do it. Do you save your opinions for 
the paper and, and for the book? Are you the person at the dinner table who people are like, oh, ask Roxanne, what does she think about X? Uh, people are often asking me what I think. I think at I write in the introduction of the book that sometimes people seem to see me as an opinion vending machine. But I grew up in a very opinionated family where my brothers and I were encouraged to share our opinions all the time, uh, which I think contributed to the place I'm at today where I get to write my opinions for a living. And when people ask me their opinions, if I actually have an opinion, I'm more than happy to share it. But sometimes I know it's better for me to listen and learn than to opine. And fortunately, the older I get, the more I recognize the difference. Roxanne Gay, uh, what a privilege to have you on the show and talk to us. Want to let our viewers know that her book, Opinions, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, a possible breakthrough in the fight against skin cancer and the middle school student who developed it. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? I, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, a Virginia teenager who set out to create a money-saving skin treatment may end up saving lives as well. His passion might have produced an astonishing breakthrough in the fight against a disease that affects millions of Americans every year. Ariana Nally has his story. Meet Heyman Bekele. He's just won a prestigious award for his invention. It's called SCTS, and that stands for skin cancer treating. So its main purpose is to treat minor forms of skin cancer. But perhaps most impressive, his age. Heyman is just 14. As part of 3M's Young Scientist Challenge, he came up with a low-cost soap that delivers cancer-fighting drugs via nanoparticles, which work to activate the body's immune cells to fend off cancer. The high school freshman from Virginia was four years old when he emigrated from Ethiopia. He says it was those years in his native land that inspired his creation. I I actually saw a lot of people who were working long hours under the hot sun. People work really long hours in the sun and there is no uh, awareness or any sort of information being shared around about how dangerous sun exposure really is. So then when they do end up developing issues like skin cancers, uh, it's really just incredibly difficult for them to be able to afford the uh, affordable cures. And the best part of Heyman's soap is just how affordable it is. It only costs as low as $8.50 in comparison to modern day skin cancer treatments, which the average price of skin cancer treatment is almost $40,000. His soap won him that 3M challenge and he's been awarded $25,000, which he plans to use on helping secure a patent for the soap and to help pay for college. He's got big plans for the future. So by 2028, I actually hope to turn this bar of soap into a nonprofit organization where I can provide equitable and accessible skin cancer treatment to as many people as possible. So impressive. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from him down the road. Our thanks to Rhiannon for bringing us his story. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. Mrs. Kennedy's dress was stained. Her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline and Kennedy. The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Traveling with the president in Dublin, Ireland, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.